Hey everyone, and welcome to another episode of Analyzing Historic Photographs. I am Mike B, and we're going to be continuing with the Vietnam portion of this series. I'm playing dress up, you know, to kind of fit in with the theme that we're talking about today. We're going to be doing another Vietnam War uh, photograph, and this one's going to be another one that's shot in Kodachrome. You'll see that. The reason I do these videos is several things. One, they're easy for me to do, and I enjoy doing them. People seem to enjoy the series so far. The feedback's been really positive, and um, I, I enjoy doing this. It's very fun. And also, I've had people contact me who are educators who say that they're having issues with younger people that they're educating, being able to have this kind of analytic thinking when looking at a historic piece or photograph specifically. Uh, you know, a picture says a thousand words, that's an old saying, and that's very true. Um, we'll see if I can get to a thousand in here, shouldn't take long, very easy for me with my rambly little mouth. But um, we're going to be taking a look at a photograph today and analyzing it from a historic standpoint. Now, my knowledge may be very different than yours. I may know a lot more or I may know a hell of a lot less than you do. But I'm just going to be analyzing this the way I do it with my level of knowledge. And we're going to be able to find out some things, um, not knowing really what the context is, but just things you can tell from the way things were. Um, anyway, so... If I miss something, which is very likely in all of these, let me know in the comments. And um, if you disagree with my assessment, also let me know. Or if you just enjoy this, let me know. So anyway, here's the photograph. And right away you can see it's it's a kind of a humanist photo because you've got a close-up of several soldiers, or not, they're not soldiers, we'll get there, several guys' faces. And uh, then you kind of get into the details, right? That That's what hits you right away is, oh, there's a tank in the background. Oh, there's actually two. There's a couple, a bunch of guys kind of walking. This guy's got, you know, what you would first think is a machine gun sitting on his shoulder, what kind of correct, but uh, now we'll get into the details, right? We'll get into the actual human part of it. So the first guy, he's looking at the camera like, hi, hey, what's up, man? You know, just kind of like, hi, it's the neutral, tired, you're in the suck, life is not fun right now, look. Um, again, a lot of people that I, you know, jokingly call the Boomer Brigade on Facebook or whatnot on the internet in general, even on Reddit and stuff like that, we'll say, oh, he's got the thousand yard stare. Those eyes have seen too much. To me, he just looks like he's freaking tired. Um, I've seen that look many times of people that weren't necessarily in combat. The chances of this guy having been in combat, though, are pretty high based on um, when we actually get into the assessing the gear and where I, what unit, or not what unit, but like what I think these guys are. So the guy behind him is just kind of walking too. He's just tired. It's like, you know, the emotionless, just, God, this sucks. I can't wait to go to sleep or... You know, man, this is hot. It's miserable here. And the guy behind him, the third guy, is smoking a cigarette in true American warrior spirit fashion. And then the guy behind him has got his, or two, the next two guys that you can see before it starts getting really blurry have got their eight point utility covers on, which would indicate they are Marines. Now, there's several other indications that uh, they're Marines, but which we'll get to. But that's a dead giveaway right there is the eight point utility cover. Only the Navy and the Marines wore those. And these guys do not look like CBs or any other part of the Navy. Now, the guy in the front, our front guy here, he looks, uh, you know, very content and very happy with everything. He's got an airborne, he's got an M1C on, right? So he's got the A-yokes and then he's got the airborne chin strap hanging off of there. Now, this was not uncommon during the Vietnam War for Marines, uh, airmen, sailors, everybody to get issued these. They got issued whatever they could. Obviously, these are going to go towards to airborne and air mobile units first, but whatever they have in stock is what you're going to get issued. Why he's got the airborne chin cup on, I do not know. Why he's got his A-yokes down and not tucked into his helmet, I don't know. But you see a lot of photographs of soldiers and Marines and everybody with these once in a while. Now, another, another dead giveaway that these guys are Marines is the lack of the elastic camouflage band around the helmets. These are just covers on here. The Marine Corps, I don't believe, was ever issued those elastic bands in mass. Sometimes they used um, inner tubes from tires and used that. And it looks like he's got something like that going on. Or maybe that's just the, the chin strap from the liner. But that wouldn't have, I don't know. It's, it's insane to me what's on the front of that. It might be the inner tube, but it's not going around the entire helmet. Very weird. Now, on his shoulder is actually an M14, if you didn't realize that. Not everybody just carried machine guns that way. The M14 is not exactly a super lightweight rifle. So it's actually pretty comfortable to hang your hands up like that after you've been walking for a while. And when you go down to his gear, he's got the M1961 United States Marine Corps um, webbing system set up with M14 magazines clearly visible. His pouches are unsnapped. And going up a little bit, he's wearing first pattern jungle fatigues via the exposed buttons and the shoulder epaulets and slanted pockets. No t-shirt underneath, which is very common because of the heat and humidity there. And the jungle fatigues were specifically designed 
to allow air to move through and be worn loosely. So that's um, pretty, I think the guy behind him, yeah, he doesn't have a t-shirt on either underneath. That's, that's pretty standard for Army and Marine Corps out in the field. You don't see a lot of t-shirts being worn underneath. You wear as little as possible. Jungle fatigues are more convenient because they've got pockets and they're a little bit heavier and they don't tear as much as a t-shirt. But you do see guys rocking t-shirts alone out in the bush. And then, the, yeah, the second guy is, looks like he's got either first or second pattern jungle fatigues on. So these guys <clears throat> are probably Marines there in 1965 or 66 because they're still carrying M14s for the most part. And they're wearing first patterns. So this could be either 65 or 66. Could be later, but more than likely it's one of those two years. They've got what I believe, I don't know tanks that well, but I believe that's an M48 Patton. Both of those, the Marine, uh, Marine tankers rolled those quite a bit with the 90 millimeter gun. Uh, I could be wrong though. So that's something that I, I'm not an expert on, but that's one of the most common tanks used because of its size and the firepower. So I don't know where these guys are. Obviously they're somewhere in Vietnam, but I don't know exactly where they would be. They'd probably be up north where most of the Marines were somewhere. Um, but yeah, it's still early on. But yeah, I mean, you can see this and you can see uh, the guy behind him, of course, most, I think all the Marines in this picture have an M14 that are, you know, riflemen and stuff like that. His suspenders are a little bit weird. Those are the old 19, looks like the 1951 or 36 suspenders even. Like they're not the 1956. The Marine Corps always gets issued hand-me-down stuff and old stuff because of their lack of budget. It's still true to this day, even though they've got their own stuff that's still used and abused, road hard and put away wet, and they don't stop using stuff until it is completely screwed. And even then, they still issue it out a lot of times to Marines, um, from all my Marine friends that have told me. Anyway, <clears throat> so yeah, you can see a lot going on in this photograph. The, the, I love the Kodachrome again. I love seeing pictures in actual color the way they were, not somebody's interpretation of colorized photograph, even though it's nothing against them, but sometimes the colors aren't exactly the way they were, whereas Kodachrome allows us to see these things in color. So, I don't know if I missed anything else. I really can't see any more details. Uh, his watch is on, you know, the inside of his wrist, which people were asking me why I do that. Some people in the military, that's just the way I was told to do it, to reduce glare and whatnot, and doesn't get caught on as much stuff. Um, this guy's got the watch on like that, on the reverse from normal, as people would say. So, that's another little detail. <clears throat> And yeah, I mean, these guys look young. The average age of an infantryman is like early 20s. So that's about what these guys look like. So, all right. I believe that's all I've got. Let me see and do a once over again. Yeah, very interesting. So these guys, the tanks look like they're stopped. These guys are just walking. They're not actually actively in a firefight, which is good news for them until it probably happened later on. All right, we're going to stop assuming. So that's what I've got for this analysis of this photograph. Um, Vietnam War photographs are really, really interesting, especially when they're um, in Kodachrome color. So, yeah, that's what I've got. If you disagree with me or if you want to add something or you learn something, whatever, let me know in the comments. We'll get a good discussion going about this particular photograph and all the other ones in this series. So I'd also like to thank the sponsors of this video, who are my Patreon supporters and channel members. You guys are awesome. Um, it's great to remain self and crowdfunded and not having to take corporate sponsorships just for the sake of getting money. Um, obviously, if a company wants to send me products to review and then work out a sponsorship like that that I believe in, that's one thing. But it's really nice to only be held accountable to myself and my viewers and not be held accountable by other companies and stuff like that. So that's why I love crowdfunding as an option for content creation like this. So Patreon and channel membership, five bucks a month or more on either support method gets you into my Discord server, which is really cool. It's very interactive. I'm usually on there poking around, talking shit, um, saying things, learning things on there from people. So it's a pretty fun experience. A lot of people on there, a lot more than I ever expected would be on there. Anyway, uh, if you can't support the channel financially, um, I totally get that. You can support my work by just you know doing what the YouTube algorithm likes, liking this video, commenting, subscribing, and sharing this video out. That's the first and the best way to actually get the word out about this, and hopefully somebody else can learn something or start up a discussion. So, yeah, um, your support really helps either way. If it's financial for like ballistic tests and stuff like that, or just you know supporting me by sharing, getting the content out there, so more people get access to this stuff, and more people might get interested in military history it's kind of my thing that's why most of these are going to be military related i'm sorry even though history is not just military but that's kind of my area of expertise but anyway i'll stop rambling i really appreciate everybody watching and we'll see you on the next episode of analyzing historic photographs